I can't tell you how many times I've stood in the kitchen in the mornings making coffee for me and tea for my wife. When my wife throws open the blinds on the other end of the apartment and says, Babe, come look at the sunrise. And if I'm too caught up in that process of morning caffeination and I don't get over there right away, I really do miss the most spectacular moments of the sunrise. We're really blessed to see beautiful sunrises over Afton Mountain each morning. And I know that many of you are blessed as well to see great sunrises from your homes as I see all the beautiful pictures on Facebook in the mornings. But sunrises are tricky. The most beautiful part of a sunrise seems to only last for a moment, and then it's gone. The rest of the sunrise is still pretty, but the moment of true glorious transcendence is fleeting. Like fresh fallen snow, something we've been all too familiar with over the last few weeks here in the valley, there's something sublime about the fresh, untouched snowfall. And then the dog goes and runs through it. And then it melts. And then it gets plowed and shoveled. But that fresh fall is glorious, transcendent beauty. Likewise, I love mountaintops and their beautiful views. And Gornergrat in Zermatt, Switzerland, was the single most amazing mountain I've ever visited. Sitting over 10,000 feet above sea level, Gornergrat's viewing station sat on the bald-faced mountaintop just under the height of nine or so mountain peaks all around in the Alps and gave the most breathtaking view of Switzerland's famous Matterhorn. My wife and I went on this trip in late May, which isn't peak tourist season for a Swiss ski town. So on this particular afternoon, we found ourselves almost entirely alone on this breathtaking mountaintop. You could stand in the silence of the mountaintops and drink in the view while all around you the glacial ice, the most powerful force on the surface of the earth, sang its ancient melodies through the still crisp air. It was glorious transcendent beauty. Sunrises and snowfall give us a beautiful glimpse of God's glory and a taste of how fleeting it can be in the midst of this mortal coil. And I believe there are few places on earth that so readily proclaim the glory of God like the top of a mountain. The glory of God is that which makes you feel so immense and infinite and at the same time minuscule and insignificant. God's glory takes your breath away. It's almost impossible to quantify or articulate, and yet it is that of which it is impossible to remain silent. God's glory reveals God's infinite wonder, yet points to our valued role in God's reality. The breathtaking beauty of a sunrise, the peaceful perfection of snowy silence, and the glaciers singing their ancient hymns of praise as they carve their way through the mountains. These moments, and so many more, I believe we witness the glory of God. Maybe then it just makes sense that this transfiguration story we hear today happens on top of a mountain. God's glory shone around Jesus. He was revealed in his full divinity with the weight of importance that comes by being accompanied by Moses and Elijah. This was a glorious moment. It was breathtaking and indescribable. But think about it. The disciples were standing in the presence of the greatest heroes of their faith. Of course, all they would want to do was talk about this moment that they could never truly fully describe. And Peter, James, and John revealed exactly why Jesus didn't walk around like this all the time. We humans have no clue how to appropriately handle glory. Peter, James, and John wanted to stay. They wanted to build shelters and stay in this one moment forever. They wanted to stay and revel in God's glory, but they didn't make any efforts to send for others or invite others into the place of glory. I don't think they could have decided who to send down the mountain. But this is the natural and easy human reaction, right? They wanted to stay in this glorious moment and keep all that glory for themselves. And I get it. I wanted to stay on Gornergrad. 
It took a lot of willpower to get on that train and head back down the mountain. Renna and I bargained, and we actually stayed an extra hour up there. We took so many pictures and videos, but looking at them now, they just don't do the mountains justice. Neither do the pictures of sunrises or fresh snow capture the glory of those moments fully. And it you know, would have been very expensive, lonely, and impractical to stay there at the top of the world. It wouldn't have made much sense to stay, but I, like the disciples, wanted to keep this glorious moment for myself forever. Yet the sun must keep rising, the snow will melt, and eventually we must come down the mountain. Peter, James, and John wanted to hoard glory. This is objectively understandable. This is human nature. This is the nature of an economy of scarcity that says there's never enough. Surely there could not possibly be enough of this goodness to share. I've got to keep it all for myself and stay right here with it. And if we're not alone in recognizing the glory, then we become prone to fighting to control it. I'll admit, I don't know what to do with God's glory. Perhaps that's why this transfiguration story is so important and so challenging. Because I, I feel like I kind of know what to do with grace. I know I don't deserve it. I'm working on how to share that with others, and it helps me to know that they don't deserve it either, which I think is the point of sharing it. But grace is rooted in humility, so maybe that makes it easier to handle. But glory? That's a whole different ballgame. Glory is God's goodness and God's power made known among us. Objectively, I think God's glory is much more scarce in this world than God's grace, but God's grace and God's glory go hand in hand. If we're being perfectly honest, I believe that we humans fundamentally can't handle God's glory. Maybe that's why it's reserved for mountaintops, sunrises, and snowfall. Mountaintops are comparatively small points of space to reveal the fullness of God, and we can't stay there. It's impractical, unsustainable, and irresponsible to stay on a mountaintop. Yet we are forever changed by this experience with God's glory. We are meant to be full of it, to be changed by it, but we can't hide it away. We can't keep it all to ourselves. We are sent to share the glory of God. Glory is like a cosmic game of hot potato. We can't hold on to it alone for too long before we have to share, and if we do hoard it, then we get burned. Worse yet, others will get burned. Now, I'm not trying to talk about a hellfire kind of burned. It's a metaphor, and in a hot potato, if you hold on to the hot potato, you get burned. But in this sense of hoarding, controlling, and thinking we can restrict the glory of God, we will hurt ourselves and worse yet, we will hurt others. So what is the glory of God in this story that we hear today? I mean, we can all appreciate the spectacle and wonder of divine transfiguration, the dazzling whites and the appearance of two really old, arguably dead guys, but what is the glory that can be shared this transfiguration day? This has to be bigger than a cool magic trick on top of a mountain, right? Well, our lesson says, Moses and Elijah appeared in glory and were speaking of Jesus' departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Departure is a weird word to use in this context, right? That seems like an odd way of talking about what we all know is going to happen in Jerusalem. But the Greek word here for departure is exodus. Yeah, like that exodus. They appeared in glory and marveled at Christ's exodus. Moses' exodus was following God and delivering God's people out of slavery in Egypt and into freedom, forming a new covenant of promise and hope for God's people. So what is Christ's exodus? What is it if not a way out of slavery? What is it if not deliverance and hope, the liberation of God's people from the power of sin and death? What is it if not proclaiming a way of a kingdom of mercy and compassion here and now? That death and violence and power and exploitation do not have to be the ways of the world anymore. That is the glory of God. God's true power and purpose made known amongst us. 
God's glory is liberation. God's faithfulness to Israel has been made known through the first exodus that we might come to believe that God is faithful in this exodus. Sunrises, snowfall, and mountaintops liberate us for a glorious fleeting moment from the ordinary doldrums of this life. God's love liberates us from scarcity, fear, sin, and shame. Christ's glory is love and hope. Christ's glory is Christ's exodus. And Christ's glory is forever. This exodus is for you and for all. This exodus is intimate and connects you with all people across all time. This exodus is God's tender mercy paired with God's awesome power. That's the glory we find here this day. That's the glory in God's word. That's a glory that can't be hidden away or hoarded. This is glory to share. But sharing is not our first instinct. We humans fundamentally have no clue what to do with God's glory. We hoard glory. We seek comfort and respectability to have it all to ourselves. It's easy to start thinking there's not enough of God's glory to go around. And so it becomes easy to deny the glory of liberation and hope to those who don't think like we do, who don't look like we do, who don't love like we do. We start denying glory to those who haven't studied like we did, who weren't raised like we were, and don't have the means that we do. So we build rules and divisions and walls and prejudices to hold on to our glory because, let's face it, we don't have a clue what to do with this. So what does Christ do in this story with the glory of exodus and liberation that he revealed on the mountain? We see him walking down, walking down the mountain with his dumbfounded followers, only to find his other followers are so full of pride from the glory of their own works that they can't manage to heal a sick child. So Jesus shows them what to do with this glory. You share it selflessly. You use this glory not for the buildup of yourself, but for the liberation of others. In this game of cosmic hot potato, we hold on to glory long enough that our hearts are set aflame with a desire to share it with all we meet. This liberating word, this glory we know, is meant to be shared. Because we are the crowd at the bottom of this hill trying to figure out what the heck we're going to do with this glory we found. We're going to try and rely too much on our own power to create an exodus under our own terms. We're going to mess this up and try to hoard God's glory. But we've been given glory to share. Where we have set up our dwelling places and denied the humanity of our siblings, we're called to share God's glory. Where we've set up our dwelling places and become too enamored with power and privilege, we are called to share God's glory. Where there are those who feel that they are lesser, weary, hopeless, broken, unworthy, or lacking, we are called to share God's glory. This is a glory that unites us with all people, yet names each of us beloved. This is a glory that takes our breath away, and yet fills us with prophetic voice. This is a glory that's hard to handle, and yet it is handed to us nonetheless. This is a glory that proclaims liberation for all God's people. This is our glory, this is God's glory, and it's glory to share. Amen.